so, so let's then do start taking this Mars as the abode of life apart. Um, again, as I said, it was written over a century ago at this point. Uh, it's an important text in the history of Mars exploration, but it is in no way an important text in Mars planetary sciences today. Okay. And that's just kind of the nature of science. I mean, you can have, you can have philosophy texts that are 2,000 years old and they are still core canon for the discipline. Science really doesn't work that way. You know, even stuff that is 30 years old in terms of Mars exploration is hopelessly out of date. Um, and, and most of the sciences work that way as well. So, let's just quickly do recap what the argument is that Lowell's making. And again, one of the main reasons I have you suffer through this text is that you know, it's an example of, of someone taking and making a book-long argument where, you know, the points I'm making in chapter 3 and 4 really relate back to what I developed in chapter 1, and in our modern information age, you really don't get that much anymore. So, main points of chapter 1, you know, anyone, not just the chapter 1 folks. If you had to boil chapter 1 down into the two or three main points that that chapter was developing, what would they be? <coughs> Planets have a, a predictable series of stages that they go through. They have a particular lifespan. Uh, this derives directly from the way Lowell imagined planets to develop as this accumulation of material leading to a molten hot orb that just in Lowell's model gradually cooled down over time due to radiative heat loss. You know, a fairly well-known physical process of transferring heat through radiation could explain how you start off with these molten planets and they eventually become as cold as space, and in between there are particular stages that they go through. And, you know, there are the details. There's the, the solar stage, the molten stage, the teraqueous stage, the terrestrial, all that stuff. But the main point is planets have a finite lifespan. They age in a particular way. We can understand that. We can make predictions about it. And the other main point is, I think, how do big and small planets differ in that uh, progression? And that's not a rhetorical question I'm asking. How, how did Lowell think that large and small planets differed in this? <coughs> that, um, that smaller planets, smaller planets, they lost their solar, they, their uh, atmospheres quicker, and that they would die out fast. Yeah, and generally they just lost their heat faster, and that just kind of drives everything. So uh, small planets age faster, and uh, larger planets. So in Lowell's conception, you know, Jupiter is this huge, massive planet. They could tell that from telescopic observations. So you know, it's got to be really still early in its process, which is why, if you look at it, it's, you know, it's covered with all these clouds and stuff. Um, so chapter two, key point about chapter two. Maybe we can boil it down to maybe one or two. For there to be life, yeah. So life is a natural outgrowth of the conditions that planets go through. There's no, you know, there used to be this idea that life had some kind of vital essence and you still, you know, you still come across this idea when you've got movies about space vampires sucking the life force out of people, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that idea of vitalism you know, had a stake drawn through it by biological investigations showing that biology is basically just very complex chemistry. And so if you've got planets that are going through these life stages where there is, you know, a surface and there is water and there is heat and energy source and there are el chemical elements, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, uh, you know, naturally life will just 
tend to develop out of the complexification of the chemistry that those kinds of environments are going to produce. You have enough energy pumping through an environment, driving these chemical reactions. The chemical reactions get more and more and more complicated. You get more complex structures building up. And eventually you get something that looks like, oh, well, I'm not going to call that chemistry anymore. I'm going to call that life. And that's actually still a very modern view of, of the origin of life. Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is more nondescript, but it's basically talking a lot about the way that life can hold on in environments that might seem extreme. You know, Lowell talks a lot about different microenvironments that can develop in different habitats, how the environment changes over the course of the season, and, um, you know, yeah, it may be too cold on the mountainside in southwestern Arizona during the winter for uh, Colombian ground squirrels to be out and, around, out and about, and it's too cold for plants to grow, but they just have to hunker down. And then, you know, eventually summer comes, and it's warm enough, and that can drive the life processes that are needed to be driven. And then he applies that kind of to Mars, saying, well, yeah, Mars is a crappier planet than the, than, the, than the Earth, but, you know, there are times of the season and places that are going to be more amenable for life holding on. Yeah, I was going to say, um, like, uh, an example would be, like, um, microbial life under um, rocks, like very, very extreme yeah. Spoiler alert, I mean, we're going to see that the surface of life is not very hospitable, the surface of Mars is not very hospitable to life, but, and so now much of the focus on looking for existing life on Mars is really saying, well, can we get something on Mars that will allow us to drill down to look for potentially life hanging on in un underground habitats? And if we do that, are we going to screw things up by contaminating, uh, you know, so that's, that's coming up. Chapter 4 is an important one for our understanding of the Earth. And the big focus on Chapter 4 was, I mean, the title is Mars is the Harbinger of the Earth, or something like that. So the key argument he's making in Chapter 4. Omar. Yeah, so you sitting there, you can look at me and say, oh, that's what I could be in several decades. Um, that's basically what Lowell is doing with the Earth. Earth is younger, Mars is older. Oh, we look at Mars, that's likely to be Earth in whatever time frame. Okay. And conversely, if we look at what's going on in the Earth, that could be a representation of what Mars was like earlier in its lifespan. Now we'll see, one of the things I'll cover in this presentation is that Mars is not a harbinger of the future of, of, of the Earth. We'll look instead at Venus. Uh, as I said when we were doing these chapter 5 and 6, chapter 5 and 6 are really where Lowell kind of derails his argument. But the key point within the context of the, the arguments he's making, the key point for Chapter 5, which we just covered, is... <coughs> that the canals could have supported water as those support. Yeah. Uh, that the, the canals are these structures that are involved in moving water around. And then Chapter 6 ties it all together, as we've already talked about, that um, all of this stuff, paints a picture of a dying planet that pre presumably had life develop. We see areas that we interpret to be st uh, stands of vegetation. We see, I mean, we can't see little kangaroos hopping around on the surface with the telescopes we have in uh, um, the 19th century. But what evidence of animal life can we see through the telescopes, according to Lowell? Um, so for the outside? No. Uh, what, what feature on the planet that, you, that, that Lowell's been looking through the telescopes really indicates that there is more than just plants on the surface? The canals. The canals. Okay. 
So we can't see the animals, we can't see the beings, we can't see the intelligent civilization people, can't even see their cities, but global system of canals is something that, you know we can see. And so it ties it all together into this story we've talked about, about this tragic, dying, intelligent civilization trying to hang on by moving water around on Mars through the system of canals. And uh, I know I won't convince all of you, but it's a very engaging story, and it's very compelling, and uh, full of pathos, and uh, you know, really, you ought to feel sorry for those, for those Martians. Okay, so let's actually start pulling some of this apart. Lowell's basic model of planetary formation drew upon uh, this nebular hypothesis that was uh, actually predated him by um, maybe a century. Uh, it's been well known that uh, planets form around stars, and the way that they could do that would be by the secretion of materials. Uh, this is still basically the way we think planets um, form. Uh, you know, early in, in Earth's history, it was a molten ball of rock because of all the impacts of, of the secreting matter. Uh, what we don't think is that that necessarily then leads to the planets going through this series of life stages that Lowell laid out. Okay. Did you say doesn't? It doesn't. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, Jupiter is not still molten and covered with clouds because it's a huge planet. Uh, a couple of, of issues that Lowell had, and the next slide will actually show more of these. I mean, Lowell had no idea about the time frame we're talking about. At the time, people thought maybe the Earth was some hundreds of millions of years old. You know, no one knew that the solar system was 4.56 billion years old. And, you know, that immense stretch of time is difficult for us to get our, wrap our minds around, but it also really, um, I mean, the type of processes of cooling off due to radiant heat loss that Lowell's talking about would have been over in a geological blink of an eye and really not relevant to the future development of any of the planets, either the terrestrial planets or the outer gas giant planets, which is what we know them to be now. So some things that Lowell did not know, at the time he was writing, radioactivity had not been discovered. So no one knew that there was actually an internal source of heat in all of the planets due to the radioactive decay of different elements. Um, so that you know, is a constant source of heat that's generated on the inside of the planet that has to work its way up to the surface to be radiated away. But what Lowell really didn't, uh, I mean, that's, that's a partial factor, but uh, the big influence of what's controlling the temperature and climate and so forth of a planet is really the, the heat budget. This balance of incoming solar radiation, how that heat energy is processed, through the atmosphere, if there is one, by uh, uh, you know absorption and re-radiation by the surface and re-radiated out into space, that is going to um, really drive, like I say, the planetary temperature, the kind of climate processes that are seen, and so forth. Um, you know, Lowell had this description of. You know, early Earth was covered with clouds because it was hot and steamy. It was still cooling down, and therefore most of the uh, impact, influence of, on the conditions were internal to the Earth. And it wasn't until the Earth and other planets cooled down enough for the clouds to go away that the sun, sun started to have the influence. No. Uh, basically, this solar heat balance basically drives everything on the planets from almost the beginning of the planets. So all of Lowell's discussion about how uh, Gia was cloudy in the Paleozoic, and we know that because we don't see any growth rings in the woody plants that were there. Well, 
we don't see any growth rings in those woody plants because the kind of tree ferns that grew in that time did not grow through the use of annual rings. So um, that was kind of a misinterpretation of the evidence. He was so convinced that Earth would have had an early cloudy period that he saw something and you know, used it as evidence even when it wasn't. So if we look at the temperature of the planets, clearly there's a general uh, progression that the further away the planets are from the sun, the colder and colder they get, with one notable exception. Can anyone see what that is? What's planet number two from the sun? Venus. Okay, so Venus is this outlier here. And this is why Venus is going to be the harbinger of the future of the Earth and not Mars. Okay. So Lowell's got built up this idea of how planets go through this aging process. And part of that aging process in Lowell's conception is that over time the planets lose water. And really there are three ways that Lowell thinks that planets can lose water. So I've got a planet here. And it's got some water. What are the ways that the water can be... Okay, so if you've got a model of planetary development that is essentially a, a simple physical cooling of a hot object, as it cools and shrinks, there are going to be stresses. That's going to lead to cracking. Lowell has this conception of planets as this large rock that has all sorts of cracks and fissures, and gravity, water flows downhill um, under the influence of gravity, and so over time, where's, where, where could the water go? Could seep down into those cracks, get deeper and deeper and deeper, and how am I going to... So, I don't know, the water's working its way into cracks and deep in the earth, and it's not on the surface anymore. The surface dries out, and us poor earthlings and Martians living on the surface gradually don't have, have water anymore. Other ways we can lose water. Did you say you could be lost in space? Yep. So, zoom. Okay, water molecules are in oxygen and two hydrogens. And you got water vapor in the atmosphere. It's uh, basically a molecule bouncing around. Um, gravity's going to tend to hold it to the Earth or to Mars. But, you know, some number of those are going to escape. Um, how to ask this? You know, Mars is a smaller planet. What influence will that have on the rate at which it loses water? due to this mechanism. Smaller planet means what in terms of gravity? Weaker. Weaker gravity. Weaker gravity means the planet's not holding on to the molecules in the atmosphere as tightly, which means it's easier for them to go off into space. Uh, so yeah, we've got sinking down into the planet or, or going off into space. Lowell also deals with a special case. Well, you know, a planet might go under this deep freeze thing um, that causes all the water to be locked up into the polar ice caps, and he kind of argues against that. So uh, he's thinking planets, as they age, are going to have a certain amount of water to begin with. They're going to lose that water over time, and that loss of that water is going to be reflecting the aging of the planet, but it's also going to be bad for any life that it has developed on that planet. Okay. So, um, I mean, reasonable arguments perhaps in the context of uh, you know, the uh, understanding of the physical processes at the time. He's got this very mechanical, physical cooling model of planets. So, yeah, it's reasonable that they could get fractured and so forth. It's not the way we think about things today. Uh, well, he didn't know about plate tectonics. And we, we'll talk about this more in the geology section, so I don't want to go to it in, in a lot of detail. But, uh, you know, we basically don't have planets that are this cracked ball of material with these fissures, you know, going further and further down in the planet. <coughs> We've got a core, a mantle, and crust. 
and the crust in the upper part of the mantle are recycled through plate tect tectonics in ways that we'll talk about. And so basically water at the surface of the planet is never going to get down to the core. It might be subducted down uh, a little bit as these plates move around, but eventually uh, you know, lava eruptions are going to bring that water back up as steam coming out of the, of the volcano. So we're not going to have all of our water over time gradually drop to the middle, to the, to the core of the planet. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the one mechanism. The other mechanism is this loss of water molecules to space. What Lowell really didn't have an appreciation for was the role of our magnetic field. We have a global magnetic field that shields us from the solar wind, and that's, that really helps reduce the ability of the solar wind to rip our atmosphere off into space. Um, another spoiler alert, we'll talk about the relative lack of a global magnetic field um, for Mars and what impact that has had on its atmosphere. There is a mission in, in orbit around Mars right now, the MAVEN mission, that is specifically looking at um, the processes that have been in place on Mars uh, that did actually result in probably a significant proportion of its atmosphere being stripped off into space, including water vapor. Okay. Uh, in the case of the Earth, um, we have no, no real problem uh, or danger of drying out. We do lose some hydrogen. Uh, basically, water molecules can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen being the lightest um, molecule can actually be stripped off into space but our global magnetic field helps to prevent that from happening. We also have the continual input of material. There's a constant rain of dust and particles, and every now and then we get small bolides and other things falling down on the Earth. That actually brings in not only materials, but you know, could bring in water as well. So we have basically a, a, a balanced water inventory on the Earth. <coughs> Okay, um, you know, chapter two was talking about, Lowell talking about how life is a, a natural outgrowth of um, chemical processes on the planets, and we've already talked about how, you know, that is still a fairly modern conception. Um, those same six elements that Lowell talked about being important for the development of life, we still think are, the envelopment, are important for the development of life, at least as we know it. Uh, you know, if you took my astrobiology class, we talk a little bit about life, not as we know it, but you know, mostly in terms of, of, of carbon-based life, living in a watery environment, um, you know, the kinds of chemistry we would expect to see. It's going to involve carbon, it's going to involve oxygen, hydrogen, and those other elements. And uh, you know, once life evolved uh, on the Earth, um, we've had this progression of different life forms. As some things have gone extinct, other uh, groups of species have uh, arisen by various processes of speciation. So that's fairly well known. And, you know, we expect that wherever we find a planet that has life, we're going to see a similar kind of processes directing the evolutionary history of life on those planets as well. So, you know, yay Lowell. Um, Fairly reasonable conception. Okay, Mars as the harbinger for the Earth. This is a key argument. And <coughs> what does Lowell base that on? Why is, why is Mars a good predictor for what's going to happen to the Earth? He's saying that Mars, the Earth is going to be like Mars and it's just going to dry out. Okay, so Mars is aging faster, but all planets in Lowell's conception go through the same stages. So if Mars is aging faster, it means it's going through the stages that we haven't gotten to yet, but we'll have, look, have to look forward to down the road. So, you know, if you look just at temperature over time, 
if you want to make it simple. You know, Mars is a smaller planet, probably never got as hot as the Earth because it didn't you know, accumulate as much material, and then it's going to cool off more quickly, and eventually it's going to be this dead orb, you know, orbiting out in space. So actually I should have used red for Mars. And if we think about the Earth, it probably started off maybe a little bit hotter, took longer to cool down because it's a bigger planet. And then it's going to, again, through the, go through the same stages of cooling off and losing water and losing atmosphere and so forth, but it's going to take longer to do it. So it's a fairly kind of simple argument based on you know, his, his central premise about how planets age. Uh, he tries to bolster this argument by providing evidence that, yes, I can see that the Earth is actually drying out right now. We talked about these uh, when Chapter 4 presented last time. So he's talking about, well, you know, we see deserts spreading in the Sahara and in the southwestern United States and in these other locations. So deserts are spreading. That means things are drying out. If we look at the uh, North American continent, uh, you know, back in the Devonian age, there used to be an inland sea covering the midsection of North America, and that sea has disappeared. That must mean we're losing our water, just as I said, you know, in, in my model, that we would lose water as we age. So he's got a con logically consistent argument there, but it is... Uh, um, you know, it has a logical fallacy in that it's based on some erroneous assumptions, some things that he, again, didn't know about. Um, what are some of the things he didn't know about? Actually, I shouldn't have moved to this slide quite yet. He didn't know about plate tectonics, as we've already talked about, and plate tectonics really explains why there used to be an inland sea in North America, and now there's not. The plates have moved, the plates can rise up. If, they, if plates rise up, the water washes off of them, and inland seas disappear. That doesn't mean the Earth is losing water, it just means that the continent has, has moved upward. How do they, how do they rise? Uh, well, continents can rise if, if you've got a couple of, of uh, continental plates that crash together, they can rise up. So the Tibetan Plateau, where the Him, 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 Himalayas, Himalayas are, is base, they're basically there because India broke off of Antarctica and came up through the Indian Ocean and rammed into Asia and crumpled the fender and you know, pu pushed up uh, the, the Tibetan range. In the case of uh, the Inland Sea in North America, we don't have anything quite that spectacular, although the geology of New York and New England basically re uh, res results from a whole bunch of plate collisions over time, which is why we've got such interesting geology out here. <clears throat> but uh, continental plates can, um, can be depressed uh, under glaciers. You know, the weight of ice can depress the land, and then when the glaciers melt away, the land can, over some thousands of years, can rebound, things like that. Uh, Venus is more a uh, harbinger of what the future of the Earth is. Um, and so the future of the Earth is not to become a cold, dry, wimped out world. You know, we're not going to go out with a whimper. Uh, instead, in about 800 million to a billion years, the Earth will be a hellhole just as Venus is due to runaway greenhouse effect. It's quite likely that early in Venus's history, it looked very much like the Earth. Uh, continental surfaces, oceans, and so forth. But Venus is just that much closer to the Sun, has a little bit more input of solar radiation, which means... If there's more sunlight beating down on the primordial oceans of Venus, what, is, what process is that solar radiation on the ocean basin going to drive? Evaporation. Okay. So there's going to be more 
um, a higher propen propensity of the water to be up in as water vapor in the in the ocean uh, in the atmosphere. Well, uh, water vapor is itself a greenhouse gas. So bear with me for a minute here. If we have uh, a higher amount of sun driving this process, leading to more evaporation of water from the oceans, that's going to increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And if water vapor is a greenhouse gas, if you have more of it in the atmosphere, what's going to happen to the temperature of that atmosphere? It's going to increase. So the temperature of the air is going to increase. And what impact will that have on evaporation of water from the ocean? It'll drive more evaporation from the ocean, which is going to lead to more water vapor in the atmosphere, which is going to lead to more greenhouse effect, which is going to increase the temperature of the atmosphere, which is going to drive more evaporation. So this, this feedback cycle is a positive feedback cycle. You know, every step along the way augments and gets amplified by, you know, every time you go around here. So more temperature means more evaporation, which means more water vapor, which means more greenhouse gas effect, which means more temperature, and so forth. And so the end result of this process is that uh, essentially all of the uh, water is going to be up in the atmosphere. And you're going, to have a, you're going to have the start of a very severe greenhouse effect, a runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, don't know if I want to take the, uh, the lack of oceans basically means that the Venus could no longer cycle carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere back into the planet. And I don't want to take the time to go into the details of the carbonate silicate cycle, but on the Earth, we can flush carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere by having the rainwater um, dissolve the water. The carbonic acid reacts with minerals. Carbonates go to the oceans. Uh, they get buried in marine sediments through the action of, of little things that make limestone. And then that, that carbon dioxide can be taken out of the atmosphere. It's eventually cycled back in the atmosphere on the Earth through the uh, volcanic eruptions. But once the oceans are gone on Venus, all you have at that point are volcanic eruptions adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and no mechanism to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So at this point, carbon dioxide levels build up and build up and build up and build up. And carbon dioxide is, a, is also what? A greenhouse gas. So Venus is a hellhole because it's a greenhouse effect gone wild. And at this point, uh, most of its water has been lost to space, but there's still all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's hot enough to melt lead. As the sun warms up, the Earth will eventually hit that same tipping point that Venus went through. We'll have a positive feedback cycle on our oceans, leading to a runaway greenhouse effect, which will get rid of our ability to scrub carbon dioxide from the uh, atmosphere, and Earth will turn into basically Venus. Um. Water can ex escape into space, but not at the... And water probably has escaped into space on Mars. So, uh, yeah, he's actually right there. Uh, it's not so much water escaping to space, though. Water molecules are still pretty heavy and pretty easy for gravity to hold on to them. But up in the upper atmosphere, water molecules can become broken apart into an oxygen atom, which combines with another oxygen atom, and you know, you got a, the hydrogen atoms that are released form hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is very lightweight, and it's easily lost to space. Uh, also, with the solar wind, and Lowell didn't—I mean, he was right, but didn't necessarily know all the mechanisms. Um, you know, you can have a water molecule that has one of the hydrogens knocked off, and it becomes ionized. 
And the solar wind is also um, electrically charged. So as the solar wind rushes across Mars, it's going to tend to strip away these ionized uh, water radicals. OK. Um, canals on Mars, yeah. Uh, really went off the rails there. It's clear uh, that all of the observers, and Lowell was not the only one who saw canals, but basically it was just an optical illusion. All of these researchers, all of these investigators, were trying to, I mean, they were basically working <coughs> at the limit of resolution for their instruments. You know, even through a telescope back in the uh, 19th century, you know, in the 1800s, uh, Mars is going to be this really kind of small dot, and you have to really struggle to get as much information out of what you can see as possible. Um, and so, I mean, they basically, um, Chiaparelli and others were... Um, were fooled by this, this optical illusion by, because they were trying to, to see all of these fine <coughs> details that they could barely resolve in their telescopes. And once the idea of canali, whether you think of them as channels or canals, becomes established, then it becomes much easier for other investigators you know, to be squinting through their telescopes back in the 1800s and say, oh, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that, that line that goes from there to there and, you know, draw it on their map. So it's not exactly mass hysteria, but uh, there's this saying in geology, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it, which is kind of a play on words of I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. Uh, you know, oftentimes our uh, conceptual frameworks that we use to investigate the world really influence the kinds of phenomena we can, we can observe. And then, you know, uh, evocative, but, you know, clearly there's never been advanced civilizations on Mars. Unfortunately.